police, farmer or worried public, ring Kim Latham, President and Secretary of the National Ferret Welfare Society. Arrangements are then made to collect them from wherever they may be. Once at Kim's home, they spend some considerable time, along with her many other pets and animals. And it's not unusual to find 30 or more here at any one time. Each one is examined by a veterinary surgeon and where possible are spayed or vasectomized. Then, finally, when fully fit, are carefully found new homes. So who better then to explain the features and important points of these inquisitive and active little animals? Kim first shows us a Jill or female ferret. This time of year, which is now coming up Easter time, the Jills are well into season. The signs of a Jill in season are fairly obvious, even to the uninitiated. Although she's a little shy to show you. The vagina becomes very swollen and ready to accept the hob. Now, if you have no wish to breed, as here you've seen a large number of ferrets, and so I don't have any particular wish to breed them all again. These gills run with a vasectomized hob. Because the gills can have up to two litters a year and 14 kits or thereabouts in each litter, that's an awful lot of good homes to find. There's the problem of finding the right kind of homes for your ferret, not somebody who will just look after them for a few months and then let them go or get bored with them and pass them on and they end up in the wrong kind of hands entirely to be bred from and bred from continually and get their offspring etc. So if there's no wish to breed and if you do breed it has to be for a very good reason then either keep your gills with a vasectomized hob or preferably have them spayed to stop the problem occurring at all. This is a sandy hob. He's fairly obviously male because he has a nice broad head and he's a good, decent size. He's been castrated, so he's lost his winter coat already. It's nice and short. He'd be called a sandy because he's not really polecat. He hasn't got the, the very dark legs and the very dark guard hairs, and he certainly doesn't possess a facial mask. He is indeed something like a, I suppose, a sable, the Americans would call them, which is a, a brownie colour. It varies all over his body. He has very short brown guard hairs across the shoulders, but longer down the tail and legs. But it, yet again, does not make him a polecat because he does lack the facial markings. He does have dark eyes, however, and therefore he could not be classified as an albino which requires red eyes. This chap would be called a silver mitt. He does have the dark legs of a polecat, but you can see he has white feet. Just the ends of the toes are white. He also has these lovely yellow knees and the big yellow throat patch. He doesn't have the black mask again, so he's not a polecat ferret. He, again, he has dark guard hairs, but in addition, the, si the tips are silver along the back, following the line of the spine, and around the base of the tail. So he would be called a silver mitt. The colours are amazing. You can have sandy silver mitts and polecat silver mitts, all kinds. Uh, it, it doesn't come, you cannot specifically breed a pair of these to produce an entire litter. It's difficult to breed an entire litter of silver mitts. Occasionally they come out in litters of albinos and occasionally in litters of sandies or polecats. Fairly frequently you get a mixture of all of them. I have not known anybody as yet to breed an entire litter. 
so he lacks the facial mask and so he's not a real polecat but because of his white feet and particularly white knees he would be called a silver mitt. Very handsome lad. This is what a lot of people consider to be the real ferret. He's an albino, white all over, with pink eyes. The reason of an albino, as in albinism with any other species, is that it does have pink eyes and a total lack of pigmentation. However, as we've seen, ferrets do come in all shapes, sizes, and a wide variety of colors, not just the white. This is what will be described as the polecat. He's not obviously a wild or European polecat, but he's called this purely because of his markings. He has the dark guard hair. He has a solid color tail and legs all the way down to the end of the toes on all four feet. And he does have a mask around the nose and eyes, much like the Lone Ranger. He also has quite a dark nose. Polecats vary as they do in all other colours in that some are very, very dark. He's lost his winter coat suddenly and is molting out well at the moment and so he's not as dark as he would be in the winter. He's also quite pale in comparison to a number of others of the same colour that I have here. But he would be classified nonetheless as a polecat. You can see why some people have trouble at shows with, with ferrets. It does get overwarm, they get overhandled, they get fractious and they really don't want to be there. They'd much rather be somewhere else. And he's no exception. Are oh, you, Owen? These are three more rescues which have come in recently. The chap in my right hand, male again, very large, very heavy, weighs in at about five or four and a half pounds. I would think he's, he's quite a big, chunky size. This one, still an albino, although as you can see, very yellow. As only, excuse me, <coughs> has only recently been castrated, and so his colour is still as it would be for an entire male. He will lose this in time and become as white as the first chap. And this little girl, Scrappy, the female, again you can see that the females are quite a size smaller, particularly in comparison to the very large hob in the right hand. Size, as they say, really isn't everything. Some people prefer small jewels for working. Some prefer large hobs so they don't need to net holes, particularly if they're using them in conjunction with birds of prey. And it really depends on why you want your ferret and what you want your ferret for. It doesn't matter what it weighs in at, what color it is, as long as you love it, that's all that matters. Another point while we're here, again on the aspect of breeding is that it really isn't necessary to breed your ferrets. Some of the old wives tales will tell you that you have to breed your jills or they'll die. Whilst there is a basis of truth in that, in that they have to be brought out of season or they may fall susceptible to various illnesses, they really shouldn't be bred unless there is a very good reason for doing so. If it's purely to increase someone's stock by one or two ferrets, then it's far easier and better for the Jill to acquire stock, one or two extra, from a reputable breeder, rather than going through the rigmarole of putting the ferrets through the stress of pregnancy and then probably homing too early, as most people do. 
hobs that are castrated live together all year round with absolutely no problems whatsoever. If you keep a hob entire, much as TC here is, they would fight. They would cause themselves a great amount of damage. They would fight for themselves and they would fight for any scent of female which may be around in the vicinity. Females, we discussed earlier, in that they can be brought out of season by a vasectomised hob or preferably spayed. They can also be taken to the vet for an injection of delvesterone, which, will, which is a, a hormone which will bring them out of season. Hobs, however, it's a bit more difficult to explain to them why when they live with brothers, sisters, whatever, for the rest of the winter, why in the summer months they have to live alone. Behaviourally, you will upset your ferret greatly by suddenly whisking it away from companions and putting it in a cage by itself. TC, although entire, lives with half a dozen other males, all of whom are castrated. He doesn't bother them, they don't bother one another, and they're all happy because they are companions all year round. Very important, do consider your ferret and please don't breed them unless you have to. The type of drinking bottles are many and varied. I find this type to be by far and away the best. The clear water bottles crack if left in the heat and if left in the cold. If the water bottle freezes, the bottle freezes with it. This is much harder, much more solid, and much more substantial than any other type of water bottle I've come across. It's a standard one with a, with a ball fitting, but it's better, again, than a water bowl, which ferrets have a tendency to tip up. The, as I said, the other water bottles crack, um, plastic bowls come over easily, and they swim in the, in the heavy duty bowls. So you can't really win any other way. This keeps the water going in all the time, they have, it's fresh when they want it, they lap against the ball bearing in the bottom and it holds, this holds about three quarters of a pint of water. It keeps it cold in the warm and it's safe. It's a bit more expensive than the normal water bottle but at the end of the day it's better to buy something that's, that's cost that little bit more money and you don't have to keep replacing every two weeks. Tim Latham. For centuries, ferrets have been used to assist man in catching rabbits. And as this picture shows, even today, there is no shortage of rabbits about. However, before we discover the method of ferreting, we need to know what equipment is required. Who better to explain this than the chairman of the Wessex Ferret Club, Tom Sturgis. One of the things you want to make sure about when doing some ferritin is that you've got the correct equipment. With me right now I've got the basic equipment that everyone needs when going ferritin. Let's start off, we're going to take the ferrets and we need a ferret box. I prefer that type, a single box that carries up to about three ferrets, no problem at all. A good secure latch to ensure that it doesn't come loose. We then need, most certainly, a bag to carry all the equipment in. And the bag needs a good lap over, buckle and strap with it. A good sound waterproof bag. Obviously we need the nets to put over the, the rabbit holes. And on this, I have three types of nets, but basically all of them are in bundles of five. You'll notice why this is very important when we go into the field to make sure that we got them all back at the end of the day. I use them. Those in one colour are four foot length, the dark green three foot six, and the half and a half, which are a mixture of the two colours, are three foot. Therefore, I know straight away which ones I need. And I need, as a basic, to start off, to consider a day's rabbiton, at least 30. So for the basics, I need 30. 
I also then need a ferret collar to put onto the ferret with the locator which I use up above ground which gives us an 8 foot radius I'll show you in a moment how this is actually fitted onto the ferret then with that we need a small amount of backup equipment just in case things go wrong with the modern technology ensure you've got spare batteries with you obviously the screwdriver to deal with the same problem and carry them very useful so that they don't get lost into a small bag and also a pen knife now some people prefer a large knife a lamb's foot knife I prefer a small knife very useful for skinning the rabbits and can go in any one of my pockets anywhere it's very I find that very useful and most important of all should the ferret get caught up underground cannot get out we locate the ferret it's up at an end oh maybe with a rabbit maybe not and we need a very good spade to dig down we've located we've located exactly where the ferret is the depth the ferret is at and there we dig down and that's a lovely spade you don't need something big and large but something to go down usually about three foot anything from two to five foot is the average depth those are the basic equipment that anyone must have to consider ferreting. I base my information on my father as a professional rabbit trapper for all his work in life and my own doing the same kind of work when first leaving school and more important the last 20 years where the rabbit population has drastically increased. I consider that the only way to go rabbiting is to be fully prepared and to do this I check all my equipment 24 hours before I'm going out that's to check it properly as I mentioned before it's no good making sure I've got it if I don't check it's not if it's working or not yep fine now I did say that it was more sophisticated Therefore, I want to make sure if anything breaks down, I'm fully covered. I take a second bleeper with me, second ferret finder, and make sure that that's working with both. Also, we do a number of rabbiting problems where it's very noisy, alongside roadways, railways, airports, where there's a lot of traffic, whatever the noise. And for this, I find by having a simple adaption done to the ferret finder, by the manufacturers I can place into there a simple earring aid and that then will allow me to work alongside the main road or any other noisy place on top of that then I've increased the number of nets to do a professional job and I've now got 60 in the bag this bag for carrying around for normal working purposes with another backup bag of a further 60 should I need them carried around in my vehicle to progress on to that, I may be in a position where I need to carry ferrets who aren't used to being together. So therefore I need a secondary ferret carrying box with two separate compartments in it. So that I can carry two separate, two individual ferrets who don't normally live together. Could be my friend's ferret with me or whatever. That's for your spare ferrets if you need them. And we move on, some of the problems we get is in hedgerows and open places where we have lots of brambles and dense undergrowth furs we need to clear it to get at the rabbit holes and I find that the slasher is a really first class tool for this and it saves the hands as well aided and abetted very often more in hedgerows is a pair of loppers and they're normally seen as you know in the garden for the shrubs but they're very efficient and very good a good backup tool and talking of the garden the little pair of secateurs for cutting off those little stubs of wood that stand round near the holes when laying the nets. That makes certain that the rabbit gets in the net properly and is caught. Finally, but most important, a little probe, that's what's commonly known as, for some people it may be a steel bar, point at one end, a chisel at the other, and that's used in conjunction with the spade to find out the actual location of the hole when we're digging down to it.
One of the most important things, I've mentioned the ferret finder, but we need to know how to fit it onto the ferret, and that's quite important. Obviously, I wouldn't be doing this 24 hours beforehand. I'd be doing it the morning that I'm going out. Just take the collar itself, just push one end through the other, keep it like a loop, and just place it over the ferret's head, and then adjust up, you can see the holes, to a comfortable position for the ferret, and just push through. Just turn it on the ferret's neck to make sure that it's nice and free, not too tight, but tight enough. And finally, put the loop through, and this sometimes is the difficult bit, because the ferret will insist on keep wriggling about. And when it's gone through the second ring, just pull it straight through. That's fitted. The radio was directly underneath the ferret's throat there, and obviously the first thing to do then is to test that it's working. Yes, it's working at that range, and it's working at a good range, and if I want to, I can put the ferret on the floor and test that it's working at a longer range. That's the first ferret coloured up, and as I'm taking two ferrets today, I would take and colour up the next one at the same time. Same again, one end through the other. I find this is the easiest method to put it on, just like a loop, and the ferret's own inquisitiveness takes it straight in there without any problem at all. Again, find the hole which is about right. Yes, it's nice and loose, but not too loose. It cannot come off the ferret's neck at all, and it, it needs to be that reasonably tight so it doesn't get caught up in a root or anything else underground. Thread it, the spare end through to make sure it doesn't go on. Undone. That's it, and again test it. And as I take two colours with me, two finders with me I should say, I test both of them that they're working. And at a good long range put the ferret on the ground and it's working fine. And that you need to do every time. One of the things you always need to do with the collar is to make sure that that screw cap is up tight. Not murder tight, but make sure it's real good finger tight. And you've got a good earthen circuit and everything will work okay. One of the main things to remember always with a ferret is you want to take a ferret working, you should be able to love that ferret from the day one and the ferret will work with you. There's nothing worse than trying to work a ferret, put your hand underground, and you've got a ferret down there that's going to bite everything in sight. I'm quite happy and comfortable to put my ferrets underground, put my hand in with them at any time at all. Any of my ferrets, and they work very well. You need always to show affection to your ferrets by stroking them. They love it. Talk to them if necessary. Everyone, dogs, humans, we all like to be talked to, we all like plenty of tender love and care, and a working animal is no different than any other animal, whether it be human, dog, or ferret. Here we are then on a very unusual site, and certainly not one for the novice. I've been called by the county council to reduce the rabbit population drastically, where they've been debarking the young planted trees and also doing severe damage to an adjacent farmer's winter crop. As this is a very busy dual carriageway, we are required to wear eye visibility clothing. Obviously, this is for our own benefit, as well as the passing motorists. As I mentioned earlier, this is one of the places that I find the adaption to the ferret finder very useful.
Uh, John's got one. And there we go. It's very important to break the rabbit's net quickly and swiftly. Ferreting under these conditions certainly requires a permit from the owner. In actual fact, we always carry written permission with us when doing work of this kind. General advice is that no one should go ferreting anywhere without permission from the owner. And here's a typical example. I normally come prepared to do ferreting when meeting the farmer. One of the things that he shows me is exact boundaries with adjacent landowners so that I make sure that I'm not trespassing. Whilst we're talking, he tells me of the extent of the damage, where the greatest rabbit damage is, and the areas that he wants cleared first. This was meant to be a field of winter wheat, and I'm advised that it costs some six to seven hundred pound to reseed this particular field, where the rabbits have caused very severe damage. Another important person that you must remember to work with is certainly the gamekeeper. He will tell me what areas that I can actually ferret in, what areas I'm allowed to work in. And like the farmer, or in fact most landowners, they will give me an ordnance survey map showing all the areas, hedgerows, woods, boundaries that I need to know to enable me to do a professional job. Tom Sturgis. Now, with a clear idea of equipment needed, and sound advice regarding ensuring permission to enter private land, it's time to go ferreting. So let's rejoin Kim Latham. Much as I enjoy attending the shows throughout the season and talking to members of the public, when I go out ferreting, it's nice to get away from everybody and go out by myself for a few hours with my ferrets and enjoy my sport as it should be enjoyed. Here we are at the top of the hill and whilst I look absolutely shattered, having got to the point where I want to be, it's actually a mile steadily uphill to reach this particular berry. But you can see here the damage caused by the rabbits. While looking at the ferret box, you might like to note that it is one of the more commercially made boxes available on the market. You see the different coloured nets that I use, they're actually made of rayon. I don't like nylon or hemp for a number of reasons, and these are made specially for me. The colours don't actually matter. A rabbit coming out of a dark hole into broad daylight would only see shadows rather than colour. Here we see me setting a net, stretch the net out, having unravelled it, drop the bottom ring into the hole, and spread the rest of the net around the mouth of the hole. This way, with the bottom ring in the mouth of the hole, when the rabbit comes out, it will encourage the net to slide or to purse, which, of course, is why it's called a purse net. This particular hole where you see the green net goes in, off in two directions, and where one mouthpiece goes into two holes, it's often best to use two nets. However, I was cheating on this particular day, knowing that I had another 53 nets to set after this one. Perfect timing on the part of the horses, just to show that the field that we are in does have uh, horses in it. There's normally a lot more than three, but they're probably out somewhere this afternoon. Nets set, one of the gills has been entered to the berry. On this particular day, I was working two gills and a hob. All three have been collared up, as explained by Mr. Sturgis earlier, and the first gill has been entered. The second gill, a coloured one called Rika, will now be entered on the second side, on the other side of the berry. it ferret down, net replaced into the hole, stand back and await results. 
it's best not to stand directly in front of the hole so that if a rabbit does pop up and sees someone standing there it's more likely to turn tail and head back underground and face whatever is down there rather than face a human. And now the waiting begins. There was a lot of movement around this particular hole so I moved the Jill. She disappeared as soon as I approached and then went back down again. That particular area having been worked, I then moved uphill, as I always start at the bottom of the hill with a ferret, and put her in further up. Same principle, remove the net from the, either the bottom or the side, enter the gill, replace the net and make sure it's covered properly. I don't believe it. The first proper bolt of the day, it kicks the net off and heads uphill at 70 miles an hour. Never mind, I suppose it'll be bigger next time. And so enter the use of the ferret finder. Swinging it from side to side, trying to pick up the best possible point at which to start digging and hopefully the lowest point no one wants to dig 12 feet if they can get away with six inches. The good thing about the rabbit running away uphill, although not good from the point of view that I'm supposed to be there to clear rabbits, is that at least it got away cleanly. It's in fine fettle, it's in good health, it hasn't been snared and it's not suffering. That should be the main aspect to consider. You know, even on a cloudy day, on a winter's afternoon, this view is superb. Having located the ferret at a depth of around two feet, I start to dig. The last few inches always dug out by hand. This particular rabbit had actually back netted itself and got itself well and truly tangled, hence the dig. And the reason for the grimace, I hasten to add, was because the rabbit's head was particularly entangled in the net and in dispatching the rabbit, one is actually pushing against the net at the same time, not making a meal of, of the dispatching of the animal. At this point, both jills are starting to move around, coming up all over the place. And so it was decided at that point to gather them up, pack up the nets and move on to another berry. Of the three ferrets that I've got out with me today, uh, it may be of interest to note that the average age is about three years. Ferrets, however, generally live at around eight years, but it's not uncommon to have them reach double figures. The oldest ferret that I have kept has been 13, and he died of cancer. Uh, had it not been for that, he probably would have gone on for a couple of years longer. But these are quite young, and they will keep working. And until really that uh, they feel old age has taken over. to the next berry. This is further round. As you can see, the terrain has changed slightly. We're in amongst hawthorn bushes. It's quite a small berry here. Uh, it's, I suppose, about 20 holes, but they're dotted in and around the bushes that you can see. The whole point of this particular berry is not to try and bolt anything from here specifically, but above the berry itself, Across the path is another large and very sharp bush from which it's often been possible to bolt several rabbits. They always bolt downhill and into the berry that I've netted. Therefore, the best way to clear this area is to run ferrets through it, which is what I'm going to do today. 
I just wish I could find some ferreting on flat ground for a change. I wasn't built to be a mountain goat. Here we go then, tangent the white hob is entered first and Rika, the sandy jill, goes in alongside. The holes, it should be noted, under the bush go down to a depth of about 13 or 14 feet. So having crawled in underneath it, the last thing you want to do is dig 15 feet below. Rika's decided that whatever was in there made her itch, so she's come out for a good scratch before going back in again. I felt quite excited at the prospect of rabbits bolting, but it was not to be. Right, one pointless exercise over, and the berry already netted up, we may as well work it. Thoughtful look, ferrets having been entered. Wait for something constructive to happen. And when it does, it's out of camera shot. One rabbit dispatched. There's various aspects of rabbit damage. It can be crop damage or, as you saw earlier, damage that can be caused to horses by rabbits. Either way, the rabbit is considered a pest, it does do a lot of damage and it needs to be kept under control. This is the white hob again, tangent, being put to ground. However, after only a few minutes, he decided that uh, Spring was in the air and the sap was rising and he had other things on his mind and so he was taken out of the berry and put back in the box. And one of the girls put in. In seeing the state of my clothing here, it should be noted that when one goes ferreting, don't expect to stay clean. However dry the weather is, you always end up sitting in something wet and nasty. Also, the aspect of a female going ferreting, it shouldn't be that men ferret or women ferret, and let's have different opinions on how things should be done when one goes out to ferret. It's done with the thought in mind as rabbit clearance to keep a pest under control, not one gender's opinion over another. A ferreter is a ferreter is a ferreter, irrespective of how many lumps and bumps they have and in what particular places. And as you can see, I can dig a hole as well as the next man. The tree roots around here were particularly nasty, and of course I didn't have any long arm prunes with me, and so it was a case of graft in and break them out as best possible. Here you can see the Jill poking her face through and the side of the rabbit. And out it comes. Wow. Another one for the pot. Not having closed the box properly, Tangent came out for another look round. But being well handled ferrets and knowing their job in life, they don't stray far.
So, you've seen me out today, ferreting by myself. For my sins, I'm also ferreting consultant to the Eton College Ferreting Society. And I'm more than happy to take out anybody who wants to go ferreting and who wants to learn more about the sport. Whatever sport one goes into, it's always expensive at the beginning. So the best thing to do, if you're interested in any sport whatsoever, is to contact someone who does it, or again, to contact someone who knows someone else who, who goes. If you're interested in ferreting or any other sport, you can contact the British Field Sports Society in London, or the National Ferret Welfare Society, the number of which will be shown at the end, and I can put you in touch with people around the country who will be more than delighted to take anybody ferreting who wants to know more about the keeping of ferrets, either as pets or for work, so that they too can further enjoy the company of ferrets. Thanks to Kim Latham. Ferreting can, however, be enjoyed in many ways. So finally, let's return to Tom Sturgis and discover how it can be done with four people. Here we are then, you've joined John Archer and myself on a lovely February morning, just coming up to 8 o'clock on what we hope is a successful day's ferreting. And John has just pointed out quite a considerable amount of rabbit damage to the bark, which will no doubt cause the farmer problems with gaps in the hedge in the future for stock control. John now points out to me where he considers the berry to be. To enable us to lay the nets properly, it's necessary to cut out quite an amount of undergrowth, brambles, thorn, that stops us from getting in to do the job properly, clearing back all old debris, particularly little short stubs that the nets can get tangled in. You note John has just taken off the rubber band from the bundle of five nets and has put it around his wrist for safekeeping. He will be a little slower laying this particular net so that you can see exactly what we know to be a proven method for a net to catch a rabbit properly and cleanly. He enters the ring in the bottom of the hole, spreads the net up over the hole and finally pushes the stake in firm above the hole. And this will be continued until every hole on the berry is covered. I've selected out a ferret that I'm going to put in the berry. I only normally use one ferret unless it's a very large berry. Place the box back out of the way so that we don't get confused with the ferret finder. And remember what I've said previously, always check that the ferret finder is working. Very important. Now comes the most important bit. We have plenty of time. We're out for a quiet, peaceful day in the countryside. And this is the bit that I enjoy in my own kind of way, is having the patience to just stand there and watch, watching continuously what's happening. Can I see a ferret showing at a hole or maybe a rabbit's nose? But I need patience to watch all the berry, as does my partner, John. While standing around for long periods of time, it's important, especially as it is a winter's day, to be wearing good, warm, waterproof clothing. And the dog, likewise, sitting there patiently, watching, listening. Well, at last I've located the ferret with using the finder on the other side of the edge. And it's necessary to cross the ferret finder in two directions, lowering the finder towards the ground and also lowering the depth gauge to pinpoint exactly where the ferret is. There's four of us out here today. 
We're joined by Mick and Mike. Decision time. To dig or not to dig. On this occasion, I've decided to dig. When getting down near to the bottom of the hole, it's quite important, down close to the ferret, that the last little bit is taken out by hand. Yet again, the finder works brilliantly. Here we are, right in on the back of the rabbit. If I get hold of the rabbit by its two rear legs, pull it out, I notice that the ferret has killed the rabbit. There's the ferret. Uh, always remember when picking up a ferret, always to stroke it, make a fuss of it. It's your friend. There's Mick Quelch. He's going to re-enter the ferret over on the other side of the berry. There's one. And no, it's killed quickly and cleanly. There you go. And as soon as the rabbits are dispatched, we reset the nets immediately. Hello, I've done well, haven't I? Ferret comes out to see what it's all about. John's got a broken strand there on his net. He'll place that to one side, out of the way, and use another net. We want, at the end of the day, good quality meat. And therefore it's necessary to empty the bladders first. Make sure, using finger and thumb, that the bladders are fully emptied. This can usually be done two to three minutes after the rabbit's been dispatched. It's also important, as well as emptying the bladder, to leg the rabbit. You do this by a simple slit in one rabbit's leg, thread the other leg through it, and then we can hang the rabbit up on the hedge, and all the blood in the system will drain down towards the head. For easy carrying, we usually couple the two rabbits together, so much easier to carry them, carry them afterwards or at any time. When finishing a berry, one of the important tasks is to backfill all the holes that we have dug out. And also we've got to think of the safety of horses and stock. And remember, a ferret is a carnivore, therefore its natural diet is fresh raw meat and plenty of fresh water. Certainly not the milk slops that used to be given years ago. When fed fresh raw meat and water daily, a ferret will certainly live to be eight or ten years of age. There's our my good old friend, Michael Withers. And he's even managing to lay a net with a broken wrist, as you can see. And he'll still get by, still enjoy it. He's laying a net in a rather awkward position but the emphasis is to make sure it's still done properly and that the peg goes in firmly at the top of the hole. Mick 
quilt here doing likewise four of us work together to ensure that all the holes are properly netted up you may have caught a glimpse of the dog in the background we'll keep well away at this time while we're setting nets as this is a quite a large berry Mick will enter two ferrets probably one at each end of the berry but because it's the size of the berry it would be far too much to expect one ferret to cope with a whole lot and the most important thing is there are four of us and the four of us need to be well spaced out on both sides of the hedgerow to ensure we've got total vision of the whole area so that we can see any sign of ferret or rabbit showing at a hole so we know exactly where the action is likely to occur there's many thoughts on the size of the ferret to be used or what ferret to be used hobs, jewels, big ferrets, small ferrets personally I don't think there's any difference except that an albino has got advantages where there's dense undergrowth can be seen easily and possibly hob polecats have got much more stamina but other than that the choice is yours In my opinion, dogs should be just as patient as their owners and not running around all over the place. They are invaluable for marking and my own dog Scruffy has given me immense pleasure and help in the past 12 years. By keeping alert we notice a ferret passing a hole and a good eye will automatically know there they are, the action, almost immediately. It's important that as soon as rabbit bolts into a net, if you need it, get help, get the net set quickly over the holes. Yep. And again, we're having a good day today. By a good day, I mean that rabbits are bolting well. It's a very unpredictable sport. You never know what's going to happen. When picking up at the end of a berry, always make sure it, it's done properly. You see Michael here shaking the twigs and debris out of a net, folding it correctly, and he'll repeat this five times to give himself a bundle of five nets and then replace the rubber band around those five. That way we ensure that we do not leave any nets behind on any berry, which safeguards any other animals that may be about in the future. It's now 2.30 in the afternoon and this being early February it's time to pack up. Hello there, that's one that the ferrets missed. The dogs seem to know where it's gone but I don't think they'll get much luck either, although they're very interested. The last job that we must do before going home is to gut the rabbits. Firstly, we need to dig a good hole, and in gutting the rabbits, you need a sharp knife, 
cut down the center line of the rabbit's belly just skin deep and by gently squeezing the first finger and thumb most of the bowels will come out and then again using finger and thumb finally you can pull out the stomach and again repeat this for all the rabbits and as a complete item don't forget to fill the hole in above it leaving a clean tidy job behind you and what we said early on was that we needed good clean meat if a rabbit has been dispatched cleanly then hung and gutted properly the inside should look like this then it provides a valuable food source and weighs some three to three and a half pounds well I'm doing this the lads are packing up putting the ferrets away in the box taking collars off picking up nets etc etc clearing up for the day in fact and it's time now to, to get going I pick up as much as I can carry various equipment and my free mates will bring along the rest of the equipment and the rabbits we make sure that we leave nothing behind in fact the countryside will look just the same as prior to when we arrived opinions vary on this vast subject but I sincerely trust that this will give some of you helpful hints and advice for the future ferrets are such a fascinating subject and have given me many hours nay years of enjoyment and brought me into contact with some wonderful people from all walks of life so there we must leave our look at the ferret and ferreting special thanks to Kim Latham Tom Sturgis and members of the Wessex Ferret Club if you would like more information on this subject we will leave you with contact addresses and phone numbers.